Take your Bibles, go to the book of Hebrews. Evan, good to see you, man. And uh, go to the book of Hebrews. And uh, we're going to be going to a lot of verses tonight. And ushers, go ahead and hand those out to everybody. Everybody will receive a card. And uh, the card will say, just ask. That's what it's going to say. We're going to spend the next two weeks and possibly three weeks. And um, we're going to sing a little bit next Wednesday night, take some praise. So uh, they're just going to see what the Lord does. And then we're going to take about 20, 25 minutes. And Brother Terry, if you'll step up and just let Brother Ethan know, it'll be 20 after the hour. So I'm going to just add a little bit of five minutes here. In, in, in Hebrews chapter uh, number 10, and if you'll go there, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. 23, 24, and 25 are one continuous thought because of the punctuation that is found there. So you just cannot isolate 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Tonight, I want to be that guy that I come alongside of you as we are assembling and exhort you, and, uh, and then so much the more. I always exhort, but I, I want to do a little bit more, because here's why. He's coming back. Did y'all hear that? He's coming back. Go back to verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke. Now, some people read it this way. And let us consider one another to irritate. But that's not what it says. And let us consider one another to what? Provoke unto love and to what? Good works. When we leave each other's presence, we should be loving more. And then there should be this desire on the inside of us that we just need to do more good works. There is something about a church that wants a church together. And I think I'm going off the theme a little bit tonight. Once a church together can, can, can iron sharpeneth iron and all of a sudden it's like, hey, we have an opportunity to get involved here. Let's, let's get involved here. And hey, I think we can get this done. What, what can I do? to every, Everybody loves that kind of stuff. Provoke unto good works. Back up to verse 23. Let us hold fast. This is how this whole sentence structure started. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith for without what? Wavering. How do we get to that point? Keep your eyes on him. For he is what? Faithful that promised. Our job is to provoke each other unto good works. I want to play that role tonight in your life as your pastor. Go back to Genesis and let's start at the very beginning. That doesn't mean that this is going to be a long Bible study. <laughs> but in Genesis chapter 2, you have the Garden of Eden. And a lot of times we think the Garden of Eden was about retirement, ease, uh, because there was no sin, there were no thorns, uh, the serpent was not crawling on its belly, the woman was not cursed, the man was not sweating by, the, by his brow for work. But look at verse number 15, pre-sin, look what it says there, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to what, please? Dress it and to what? Keep it. So understand that even though you, we are here in the Garden that there, there is no sin. It doesn't mean there wasn't work. Did y'all hear that? It doesn't mean there wasn't work. And if sin had never entered into the picture, it didn't mean that this Adam and Eve would stay neutral. They still would have had children. The difference is, is that now when Adam works, he sweats. And when Eve started to have children, there was, there was sorrow in childbearing. Then the Bible says that her desire would be to her husband and she now would want someone to rule over her. Where in the garden they were equals, but when sin happened, Eve was deceived, Adam was not. So now, but know this, it still was work. You, you, nobody just sat on the sidelines. Everybody got involved in the garden, all two of them. And uh, so, now that was funny, people. Go to Luke chapter 14. So throughout the Bible, let's not associate the fact that busyness is not because we're sinners. Busyness is because we are the creation of God. God always meant for his children to be busy. Busy about what? Busy about his garden. 
busy about his world. Look at Luke chapter 14 and verse number 12. In Luke chapter 14 and verse number 12, then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. Understand what he's saying here. He said, look, do not take this group, this clique that you have, and don't turn inward. In, in other words, don't just associate with people that you know. Just don't associate with people that can kind of give you back. Look at verse 13. But when thou makest a feast, call the what, please? Poor. Come on. What? Poor, the maim, the lame, the blind. And thou shalt be what? Thou shalt be blessed. By who? God. Because look what it says. For they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto them, unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. This is not, he was like, yes, this will be, this will be futuristic. He said, no, this is now. He said, a certain man made a great supper and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now what? Ready. This is the New Testament church here with Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus started the New Testament church. And I want you to notice what he said here. He said, no, 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 no. This is not futuristic. Can, can I just provoke us tonight? Too many of us are just waiting for heaven and eternity to start. And we have adopted a mentality that I'm saved. I'm just going to float waiting for eternity to start. And God, Jesus comes back. And he said, no, no, let me tell you something. He said, they, they, at supper times, come for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must need go and see it. I pray they have me excused. Another said, verse 19, I have bought five yoke of oxen. And I go to prove them. I pray they have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed the Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to the servant, the serpent, the servant. It's going to get better, I promise you. Let's just stop and just, can we just get real tonight? We give up too easily. And we think we've done our job when we hand and we invite somebody. And then we think to ourselves, well, you know, that was just the response. But the master said this, then the master of the house being angry said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, what? Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is what? Room. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges, verse 23, and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So understand that sometimes we think that because we're saved that in heaven we'll be on bumper clouds we'll just be floating we'll be by the river of life and we hear this all the time well understand in the garden of eden there was work work has nothing to do with sin work is how god made his creation to do take care of my garden sin complicated it to where now we think work is a bad thing no work is a tiring thing Childbearing now is a rough time, and the jaws of death is what they say. And I do not know if you've ever been there, and we have such great medical facilities now that they, they can pull a, a, a lady through the birthing process, and, uh, but we don't even realize, ladies and gentlemen, that as a lady is giving birth, how close she is to death as she's giving birth. And, and you and I must understand that this is a result of sin. I'm trying to provoke us tonight. If you'll let me just kind of step to the edge of who you are and take the back and just, just, just push you just a little bit. I think it was Kim. Did you bring up the Bill Rice Ranch? Yeah, we were talking about the Bill Rice Ranch. And, 
And, and I love their, their outlook on modesty back in the 70s because their, their, their fence around the pool was um, eight foot tall. Their diving board was 12. I, I, I still get a kick out of this. And, and I can remember being in like in fifth grade, climbing to the top of that diving board with my albino rhino leg sticking out, skinny as that right there, and, and they're still that way. And uh, so, uh, um, bad Bob. Uh, so, so, and then I can remember standing there, and I'm like, I, I, I don't know if I can do this. And, and my friend walked up behind me, and uh, Tim Townsend, and he just went like that. And he scared me that I turned around like this as I went like that. And that was my first experience off a diving board. Tonight, I just want to walk up behind you and go, we've really not done much if we just ask and somebody rejects. And then we come back and go, well, at least I tried. Go to, go to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, he was in the world. John 1.10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own what, please? John 1.11. I'm sorry, I'll give you time to get there. John 1.11. He came unto his own, and his own, what, please? Received him not. Christ met with rejection first. That's why the parable about the certain man is in keeping with how the Son of Man did it. The certain man sent the servants out and they met with excuses. The son of man came into his own and he met with rejection. But once you can get past that thin veil of rejection and excuses, there's something wonderful happens and there's a realm that believers need to live in and that is the realm of taking that next step to where you don't let the rejection stop you and you don't let the excuses stop you because work is what we do not because we have bills to pay because that's how we were created sin is what creates debt and just like you have a sin debt spiritually that's why all of us have debt to some degree this is just the world we live in so now we have found out that that, that we still would be working and you're saying pastor why are you harping on that because that's how we started out listen that's how we're going to end up. You see, some people think that you let the trumpet sound, our job's done. That is not true. If you will go with me, please, to Revelation. And as you're turning to the book of Revelation, I think that there needs to be a clarification on how this is going to go. The Bible does not speak past the millennial reign. Our loved ones who are gone now are in heaven because that is the holding place for all of our loved ones. Our Father, which art where? In heaven. In my Father's house are many what? Mansions. So heaven is that holding place for all of our loved ones. But ladies and gentlemen, if that trumpet sounded right now, you and I would only be in heaven for seven years. That's it. You see, we have this idea that you let the trumpet sound, we're checking out, and it's going to be retirement. That's not, the, that's not the case. Because the Garden of Eden, paradise, the tree of life has been preserved, and that tree of life will show back up in paradise. You see, God is simply taking this time that sin has fooled with, and he has said, we got to go bid people to come. We got to go see people get saved. We need people to come. The great supper's been ready. And we think in our minds, I think this way sometimes, I can backstroke it after I die. And if the Lord comes back, psh, I'm done. No, we're not. Because once if that trumpet sounded right now, we would be caught up in the air and seven years is all we're going to have in heaven. And then after that seven years is done, we come back 
to reign and rule with him. Please know this. Satan will not be a factor, but the effects of Satan, the world, and the flesh, and sin will still be a factor in the millennium. Because many people take verses in Revelation and try to put heaven to it. It has nothing to do with heaven. It has everything to do with the millennial reign. And this is where we are going to reign and rule with Christ. But people sometimes adopt a heaven mentality while they're living on earth to where at least I'm saved. And you know what? I'll just coast now. Why not? Because after I'm gone, I'll coast then. So what's the big deal? What the big deal is, you're not going to coast. Look at Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 15. And next week we're going to delve deeper into the millennium because it is very, very, very interesting. But please do not take millennial verses and try to apply heaven to them or you're going to get messed up. Like for instance, look at Revelation chapter 22 and verse 15. How do you explain this one if it's heaven? Bow wow, bark bark. Look at it. Revelation 22, verse 15. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. You see, during the millennial reign, there will still be people on the earth that are lost. And we honestly think to ourselves, I don't have to do anything. This is why he said over and over in the Gospels, do not take your ease and eat, drink, and be merry. Do not build bigger barns and then just coast. Do not look at your life as I'm saved. Everybody else can kind of get involved. I tried it and now I'm retired. Newsflash, reigning and ruling takes work. The difference is going to be we will not be hampered by sin. We will return to a Garden of Eden status. The lion will lay down with the lamb. But ladies and gentlemen, and look at verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the what? In the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star, now, before we go to verse 17, would you please go back to Luke 14? So kind of hold your place at Revelation 22, 17 and go back to Luke 14. This certain man, remember the certain man that made a supper? The church in the New Testament with Jesus. Look, this, this, this certain man in the story that's being told, verse 15, and when one of them that sat meet with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said, then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, What? What? Say it out loud, please. What? Come. For what? All things are ready. Now go back to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. And the spirit and the what, please? Bride, say what? Come. Do you have any idea what this is just telling us? You see, right now there are local churches everywhere. And guess what our job is? Our job is to go to the harvest. Say ye not there are yet four months and then come at the harvest. Lift your eyes up and look for the fields are already what? White unto harvest. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And, and, and where you and I look at it, there is, a, there is a buffet of spiritual food that there's nothing like it. Timothy Lyons invited a guy. He calls me on Saturday. He says, Pastor, I invited this guy. Could you go by? I went by Saturday. No one was there. I left my card. I went by. I, I, I was out of town, and I came back in, and, and I thought, I'm going to cut by there. So I cut by there. He opens the door, and he looks at me. and says, I got your card, Pastor. I'll be there Sunday. Because our work does not end. Did y'all hear that? Salvation did not put you in retirement mode. 
And what happens is, is we get discouraged because I asked, but I met with excuses. At least I asked. Would you let me provoke you? Would you let me step out on the diving board of your, of your world and let me just kind of... And hopefully your legs don't... Right? I don't know why I said that, y'all. But the spirit and the bride say, come. Look at verse 17. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will... Let him take the water of life freely. And a lot of times if you interpret this as heaven, you're going to get messed up because in heaven there are no dog sorcerers or anybody like that. But in the millennium, there still is this sinful society that is going on. The difference is this. You and I are in a perfect state with the Spirit of God as our soul and partner. But guess what we're still doing? Come, 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 come. The spirit and the bride says, come. And then whoever is a thirst. But there will be some sorcerers, liars, dogs, whoremongers, adulterers that want nothing to do with this. Y'all getting the picture? So please do not think I can coast my way through. And if I can make it to the trumpet. Nobody will ever ask me again to do anything. Newsflash, in the millennium, the spirit and the bride says come. You see, all the local churches are going to be now one. We'll have Jesus as our head. We will be the bride. And guess what? We're going to hook up with Eliezer, the spirit, and we're going to go out. Newsflash, you will go soul winning for a thousand years. And unfortunately, we get the idea, nah, that's what all them poor people do. Hey, 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 I'm going to be there when you get paired up with the Spirit of God and we're going to meet. We're going to get in a huddle, and I'm going to look across that huddle and go, hey, 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 hey. you didn't go one time down there, did you? Now you're going to go for a thousand years. <laughs> Together. When the rapture happens, I hope I'm making sense. When the rapture happens, we shall be caught up what? Together. And we'll be with him. Doing what? For a thousand years, while Satan is locked up, he no longer will produce the next generation of dogs, whoremongers, and sorcerers. And we got a chance for a thousand years to clean up the generation he did leave behind. To me, I love this kind of stuff. And if you would, go to 1 Corinthians 15, 24, because I'm one minute over in poor Ethan, brother Ethan. They got him hogtied. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 24. This is when the end. So so, so understand that Revelation, as you're making, go back to Revelation 22, and, and let's finish out. Okay, and the spirit and the bride say, come, verse 17, and let him that heareth say, come. You're going to want to look at it, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and out of the things which are written in the book. He which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come. Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. What he was saying was, is at the end of that thousand years, I'm coming. And at that point, ladies and gentlemen, everybody that's on in the millennial reign, if they have not accepted Christ and they're still dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers, 
they will be cast into the lake of fire. You see, we think it's going to be total ease. The indication that everything comes to an end, where is that found? It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you'll go there. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then cometh the end. Okay, so here it is. Then cometh the end when he shall deliver up the kingdoms to God, the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Verse 25, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Look at verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. So people are still, there is, they're still going to be dying. This is the last thing that, that Christ will conquer. The last enemy is death. And then after that, so listen, the book doesn't speak past the millennial reign. There is a reason for that. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, Okay, it's quiet. Either I'm not making any sense at all or you, or you understand. Look what it says here. Now, the spirit and the what said come? Bride. Ephesians 5.22 is a great husband and wife, but it goes deeper than that. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands and unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband. Husbands, love your wives, verse 25, 26, that he might sanctify it, cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a what? Glorious church, not having what? Spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So this relationship that exists between a husband and wife, listen, I'm about to tell you, should always stay a mystery. Single people have no idea what I just said, but us married people do. It should always stay a mystery. He's using generic terms here, but look at verse number 31. For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined into his wife and they too shall be one flesh. Look at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the what? church after the millennial reign is done we don't know what happens after that because it was meant to stay a mystery now there are indications that you probably could draw some summations but please know this your work and my work is not done Go back to Revelation 22, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm going to be done. I'm so sorry. Go to Colossians chapter 4. That card just to ask. When is the last time you asked somebody to come to church? And then did you take no as a, well, I at least did my job. So just ask. Just ask. If you ever hem hawed around your parents and they're like, just ask me. You know you want something, just ask. When I was preparing for this, um, uh, I asked a man, how did you get in church? And it was a distant state. And he said, oh, my, my co-worker came to work and he walked around me five and six times. You could tell he wanted to do something. And, and, and he finally said, what do you want? <laughs> he said, would you come to church with me? And he said, I looked at him and said, sure. And he went, you are? He said, the next Sunday, I beat him to church, and I'm calling him going, where are you? And he said, like, you really came? Do you know that we have this idea? I used to do that. I used to do that. But, you know, I'm retired. You're never going to be retired asking people to come. Look at Colossians. So you're going to just ask two people. Okay? Just two people. Colossians 4, 2. 
Continue in prayer. Colossians 4.2. And watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of what, please? Utterance. To speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time, redeeming the time, redeeming the time, redeeming the time. You only have that window of time, that one moment. That one moment. Judy's sitting back over here, and uh, unbeknownst to me, Amy, her daughter, and I became friends. We became very good friends. I had no idea. Like, Judy, you were coming for six months. I had no idea. She'd talk about her daughter, Amy, and I'm like, oh, I'm glad you got a daughter, Amy. And, and I was enjoying her coming to church. But do you know she's in church right now because of her daughter? And it's all because I struck up a friendship with her daughter, Amy. And verse number six, okay, I'll be done, I promise. Verse number six, let, let your... <laughs> Is that you, Judy? Yeah. Oh, that's God. <laughs> that's great. Look at it, it says, let your speech be always with what, please? What? Grace. Seasoned with what? That ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Amy cut hair right up here. Amy and Jacob and uh, cutting hair right up there. And many of us went up there. I'm, sit I'm sitting, waiting to get my hair cut. And this guy smarts off to Amy. Amy can hold her own. No, no, do not, do not trust a woman with cutting shears in her hand. She'll kill you. And I'm sitting there wait, waiting on Jacob, and I'm just waiting. And this, this guy goes after Amy. And, uh, well, Jacob, the nephew, oh, oh, this man says something snarky to his aunt. And Jacob was coming around that chair. And I'm sitting there going, Sir, I think you need to apologize very quickly. And the guy was like, when he realized he was outnumbered, he was like, I'm sorry. Y'all listen to me. You never know, and the reason I think we have a hard time getting people to come to church is because we don't live six. We don't live four six. We're the worst customers people have. We always are going after people. We're always giving our opinion. We're always doing this, always doing that. And this is where, in the millennial, the spirit and the bride will say, come, and the spirit's holy, perfect. We will be without flaw. We'll be perfect. And what a dynamic duo. And the only thing he's saying here is pray. So just ask. One, ask God to give you a door to walk through. Start praying, God, let me meet somebody. And then the second thing, just ask somebody. This is a blank card on the back, and I'm going to ask you to keep it. And then I want you to write down maybe the time that you specifically say, Lord, today. Would you give me a door of utterance and would you open a door? Would you just open a door? I'm gonna, I'm gonna brag on, on Ivan here just a moment if I could. And uh, one day at the end of the service, Ivan's coach is standing right down here. And I had met him once before and he's standing right down here. And you could tell he, he didn't come, he wasn't prepared to come for church. And so I stepped down and I said, Coach, you, you, you okay? And he was like, Pastor, I'm not. I'm not. And then Ivan was able to take him and tell him about the Savior and he trusted Christ as a Savior. Come. For all things are ready. And I'm going to ask us tonight, just ask. But first, ask God to open that door. And then when God opens that door, ask. And don't, don't just say after the first time excuse and after the first rejection, well, I tried. No, 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 no. Ask. What's the worst thing they're going to tell you? No. 
everywhere you go, start asking. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to provoke you. If I could just do that just a little bit right now. You say, Pastor, is that why we sing a lot of songs? No. C -c can I just, can I ask this question? When's the last time that somebody was in church because of you? You say, but pastor, it's not that easy. When God opens the door of utterance, it is that easy. And I don't want to get into a retirement mindset because if we think once we get to the millennial reign, we're just going to be rulers. No, those will be our position. But our work will be spirit and the bride say, come. Are you thirsty? Come. Do you want the, the, the water of life freely? Come on. I hope tonight's Bible study, and we're going to stay together next week because we're going to talk more about the millennium and why are we working so hard here. Okay, like for instance, question, you ready? You ever thought this way? Why are we laying up treasures? We got everything. Like why, what am I going to do with a bank account up there? Right? We're going to, we're going to look at the judgment seat of Christ and what does it mean to... You're going to give an account, but what does that mean? If all sins were judged at Calvary, what does that mean? I'm just telling you that this Sunday, I'm not, even, I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm not even looking for anything other than this. I don't think we're, we're, we're going that extra mile. I think that we're satisfied with excuses and rejection. And I'm not saying be a jerk, but I am saying, Lord, I'm... I'm going to get in the mode that I'm going to be living in the millennium because if that's how I'm going to operate for a thousand years, then this is the life. If that's the life I'm going to live there, this is the life I'm going to live here. Thank you for taking the time to watch one of our services here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I would love to be a blessing to you. My number's at the bottom of the screen. And if you need anything, I would love to be of help any way I can. Again, thanks for watching. I hope the sermon was a blessing to you and we will see you next time.